Chapters eleven and twelve of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eleven. He took a resolve after this not to misinterpret her words, even when Miss Stackpole appeared to strike the personal note most strongly. He bethought himself that persons, in her view, were simple and homogeneous organisms, and that he, for his own part, was too perverted a representative of the nature of man to have a right to deal with her in strict reciprocity. He carried out his resolve with a great deal of tact, and the young lady found in renewed contact with him no obstacle to the exercise of her genius for unshrinking enquiry, the general application of her confidence. Her situation at Garden Court, therefore, appreciated as we have seen her to be by Isabel, and full of appreciation herself, of that free play of intelligence which, to her sense, rendered Isabel's character a sister spirit, and of the easy venerableness of Mr. Touchett, whose noble tone, as she said, met with her full approval, her situation at Garden Court would have been perfectly comfortable had she not conceived an irresistible mistrust of the little lady for whom she had at first supposed herself obliged to allow as mistress of the house. She presently discovered, in truth, that this obligation was of the lightest, and that Mrs. Touchett cared very little how Miss Stackpole behaved. Mrs. Touchett had defined her to Isabel as both an adventuress and a bore, adventuress as usually giving one more of a thrill. She had expressed some surprise at her niece's having selected such a friend, yet had immediately added that she knew Isabel's friends were her own affair and that she had never undertaken to like them all, or to restrict the girl to those she liked. "'If you could see none but the people I like, my dear, you'd have a very small society,' Mrs. Touchett frankly admitted, "'and I don't think I like any man or woman well enough to recommend them to you. When it comes to recommending, it's a serious affair. I don't like Miss Stackpole. Everything about her displeases me. She talks so much too loud, and looks at one as if one wanted to look at her, which one doesn't. I'm sure she has lived all her life in a boarding-house, and I detest the manners and the liberties of such places. If you ask me if I prefer my own manners, which you doubtless think very bad, I'll tell you that I prefer them immensely. Miss Stackpole knows I detest boarding-house civilization, and she detests me for detesting it, because she thinks it the highest in the world. She'd like Garden Court a great deal better, if it were a boarding-house. For me, I find it almost too much of one. We shall never get on together, therefore, and there's no use trying." Mrs. Touchett was right in guessing that Henrietta disapproved of her, but she had not quite put her finger on the reason. A day or two after Miss Stackpole's arrival, she had made some invidious reflections on American hotels, which excited a vein of counter-argument on the part of the correspondent of the interviewer, who, in the exercise of her profession, had acquainted herself in the Western world with every form of caravansary. Henrietta expressed the opinion that American hotels were the best in the world, and Mrs. Touchett, fresh from a renewed struggle with them, recorded a conviction that they were the worst. Ralph, with his experimental geniality, suggested, by way of healing the breach, that the truth lay between the two extremes, and that the establishments in question ought to be described as fair middling. This contribution to the discussion, however, Miss Stackpole rejected with scorn. Middling, indeed! If they were not the best in the world, they were the worst, but there was nothing middling about an American hotel. "'We judge from different points of view, evidently,' said Mrs. Touchett. I like to be treated as an individual. You like to be treated as a party." "'I don't know what you mean,' Henrietta replied. "'I like to be treated as an American lady.' "'Poor American ladies!' cried Mrs. Touchett, with a laugh. "'They're the slaves of slaves.' "'They're the companions of freemen,' Henrietta retorted. "'They're the companions of their servants, the Irish chambermaid and the negro waiter. They share their work.' "'Do you call the domestics in an American household slaves?' Miss Stackpole inquired. 
If that's the way you desire to treat them, no wonder you don't like America. If you've not got good servants, you're miserable, Mrs. Touchett serenely said. They're very bad in America, but I have five perfect ones in Florence. I don't see what you want with five, Henrietta couldn't help observing. I don't think I should like to see five persons surrounding me in that menial position. I like them in that position better than in some others, proclaimed Mrs. Touchett with much meaning. Should you like me better if I were your butler, dear? her husband asked. I don't think I should. You wouldn't at all have the tenue. The companions of Freeman. I like that, Miss Stackpole, said Ralph. It's a beautiful description. When I said Freeman, I didn't mean you, sir. And this was the only reward that Ralph got for his compliment. Miss Stackpole was baffled. She evidently thought there was something treasonable in Mrs. Touchett's appreciation of a class which she privately judged to be a mysterious survival of feudalism. It was perhaps because her mind was oppressed with this image that she suffered some days to elapse before she took occasion to say to Isabel, "'My dear friend, I wonder if you're growing faithless.' "'Faithless? Faithless to you, Henrietta?' "'No, that would be a great pain, but it's not that.' "'Faithless to my country, then?' Ah, that, I hope, will never be. When I wrote to you from Liverpool, I said I had something particular to tell you. You never ask me what it is. Is it because you've suspected? Suspected what? As a rule, I don't think I suspect, said Isabel. I remember now that phrase in your letter, but I confess I had forgotten it. What have you to tell me? Henrietta looked disappointed, and her steady gaze betrayed it. You don't ask that right, as if you thought it important. You're changed. You're thinking of other things. Tell me what you mean, and I'll think of that. Will you really think of it? That's what I wish to be sure of. I've not much control of my thoughts, but I'll do my best, said Isabel. Henrietta gazed at her in silence for a period which tried Isabel's patience, so that our heroine added at last, Do you mean that you're going to be married? "'Not till I've seen Europe,' said Miss Stackpole. "'What are you laughing at?' she went on. "'What I mean is that Mr. Goodwood came out in the steamer with me.' "'Ah,' Isabel responded. "'You say that right. I had a good deal of talk with him. He has come after you.' "'Did he tell you so?' "'No, he told me nothing. That's how I knew it,' said Henrietta cleverly. "'He said very little about you, but I spoke of you a good deal.' Isabel waited. At the mention of Mr. Goodwood's name, she had turned a little pale. "'I'm very sorry you did that,' she observed at last. "'It was a pleasure to me, and I liked the way he listened. I could have talked a long time to such a listener. He was so quiet, so intense. He drank it all in.' "'What did you say about me?' Isabel asked. "'I said you were, on the whole, the finest creature I knew.' I'm very sorry for that. He thinks too well of me already. He oughtn't to be encouraged. He's dying for a little encouragement. I see his face now, and his earnest, absorbed look, while I talked. I never saw an ugly man look so handsome. He's very simple-minded, said Isabel, and he's not so ugly. There's nothing so simplifying as a grand passion. It's not a grand passion. I'm very sure it's not that. You don't say that as if you were sure. Isabel gave a rather cold smile. I shall say it better to Mr. Goodwood himself. He'll soon give you a chance, said Henrietta. Isabel offered no answer to this assertion, which her companion made with an air of great confidence. He'll find you changed, the latter pursued. You've been affected by your new surroundings. Very likely. I'm affected by everything. "'By everything but Mr. Goodwood,' Miss Stackpole exclaimed, with a slightly harsh hilarity. Isabel failed even to smile back, and in a moment she said, "'Did he ask you to speak to me?' "'Not in so many words, but his eyes asked it, and his handshake when he bade me good-bye. "'Thank you for doing so,' and Isabel turned away. 
"'Yes, you're changed. You've got new ideas over here,' her friend continued. "'I hope so,' said Isabel. "'One should get as many new ideas as possible.' "'Yes, but they shouldn't interfere with the old ones when the old ones have been the right ones.' Isabel turned about again. "'If you mean that I had any idea with Mr. Goodwood—' But she faltered before her friend's implacable glitter. "'My dear child, you certainly encouraged him.' Isabel made for the moment as if to deny this charge, instead of which, however, she presently answered, "'It's very true. I did encourage him.' And then she asked if her companion had learned from Mr. Goodwood what he intended to do. It was a concession to her curiosity, for she disliked discussing the subject, and found Henrietta wanting in delicacy. "'I asked him, and he said he meant to do nothing,' Miss Stackpole answered. "'But I don't believe that. He's not a man to do nothing. He is a man of high, bold action. Whatever happens to him, he'll always do something, and whatever he does will always be right.' "'I quite believe that. Henrietta might be wanting in delicacy, but it touched the girl all the same to hear this declaration.' "'Ah, you do care for him,' her visitor rang out. "'Whatever he does will always be right,' Isabel repeated. "'When a man's of that infallible mould, what does it matter to him what one feels?' "'It may not matter to him, but it matters to oneself.' "'Ah, what it matters to me, that's not what we're discussing,' said Isabel, with a cold smile. This time her companion was grave. "'Well, I don't care. You have changed. You're not the girl you were a few short weeks ago, and Mr. Goodwood will see it. I expect him here any day.' "'I hope he'll hate me then,' said Isabel. "'I believe you hope it about as much as I believe him capable of it.' To this observation our heroine made no return. She was absorbed in the alarm given her by Henrietta's intimation that Caspar Goodwood would present himself at Garden Court. She pretended to herself, however, that she thought the event impossible, and later she communicated her disbelief to her friend. For the next forty-eight hours, nevertheless, she stood prepared to hear the young man's name announced. The feeling pressed upon her, it made the air sultry, as if there were to be a change of weather, and the weather, socially speaking, had been so agreeable during Isabel's stay at Garden Court that any change would be for the worse. Her suspense, indeed, was dissipated the second day. She had walked into the park in company with the sociable Bunchy, and after strolling about for some time, in a manner at once listless and restless, had seated herself on a garden bench within sight of the house beneath a spreading beech, where, in a white dress ornamented with black ribbons, she formed among the flickering shadows a graceful and harmonious image. She entertained herself for some moments with talking to the little terrier, as to whom the proposal of an ownership divided with her cousin had been applied as impartially as possible, as impartially as Bunchy's own somewhat fickle and inconstant sympathies would allow. But she was notified for the first time on this occasion of the finite character of Bunchy's intellect. Hitherto she had been mainly struck with its extent. It seemed to her at last that she would do well to take a book. Formerly, when heavy-hearted, she had been able, with the help of some well-chosen volume, to transfer the seat of consciousness to the organ of pure reason. Of late it was not to be denied, literature had seemed a fading light, and even after she had reminded herself that her uncle's library was provided with a complete set of those authors which no gentleman's collection should be without, she sat motionless and empty-handed, her eyes bent on the cool green turf of the lawn. Her meditations were presently interrupted by the arrival of a servant who handed her a letter. The letter bore the London postmark, and was addressed in a hand she knew. That came into her vision, already so held by him, with the vividness of the writer's voice or his face. The document proved short, and may be given entire. My dear Miss Archer, I don't know whether you will have heard of my coming to England, but even if you have not, it will scarcely be a surprise to you. 
You will remember that when you gave me my dismissal at Albany three months ago, I did not accept it. I protested against it. You, in fact, appeared to accept my protest, and to admit that I had the right on my side. I had come to see you with the hope that you would let me bring you over to my conviction. My reasons for entertaining this hope had been of the best. But you disappointed it. I found you changed, and you were able to give me no reason for the change. You admitted that you were unreasonable, and it was the only concession you would make, but it was a very cheap one, because that's not your character. No, you are not, and you never will be, arbitrary or capricious. Therefore it is that I believe you will let me see you again. You told me that I'm not disagreeable to you, and I believe it, for I don't see why that should be. I shall always think of you, I shall never think of any one else. I came to England simply because you are here. I couldn't stay at home after you had gone. I hated the country because you were not in it. If I like this country at present, it is only because it holds you. I have been to England before, but have never enjoyed it much. May I not come and see you for half an hour? This at present is the dearest wish of yours faithfully, Caspar Goodwood. Isabel read this missive with such deep attention that she had not perceived an approaching tread on the soft grass. Looking up, however, as she mechanically folded it, she saw Lord Warburton standing before her. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 She put the letter into her pocket and offered her visitor a smile of welcome, exhibiting no trace of discomposure, and half surprised at her coolness. They told me you were out here, said Lord Warburton, and as there was no one in the drawing-room, and it's really you that I wish to see, I came out with no more ado. Isabel had got up. She felt a wish for the moment that he should not sit down beside her. I was just going indoors. Please don't do that. It's much jollier here. I've ridden over from Lockley. It's a lovely day. His smile was peculiarly friendly and pleasing and his whole person seemed to omit that radiance of good feeling and good fare which had formed the charm of the girl's first impression of him. It surrounded him like a zone of fine June weather. "'We'll walk about a little, then,' said Isabel, who could not divest herself of the sense of an intention on the part of her visitor, and who wished both to elude the intention and to satisfy her curiosity about it. It had flashed upon her vision once before, and it had given her on that occasion, as we know, a certain alarm. The alarm was composed of several elements, not all of which were disagreeable. She had indeed spent some days in analysing them, and had succeeded in separating the pleasant part of the idea of Lord Warburton's making up to her from the painful. It may appear to some readers that the young lady was both precipitate and unduly fastidious, but the latter of these facts, if the charge be true, may serve to exonerate her from the discredit of the former. She was not eager to convince herself that a territorial magnet, as she had heard Lord Warburton called, was smitten with her charms. The fact of a declaration from such a source carrying with it really more questions than it would answer. She had received a strong impression of his being a personage, and she had occupied herself in examining the image so conveyed. At the risk of adding to the evidence of her self-sufficiency, it must be said that there had been moments when this possibility of admiration by a personage represented to her an aggression almost to the degree of an affront, quite to the degree of an inconvenience. She had never yet known a personage. There had been no personages in this sense in her life. There were probably none such at all in her native land. When she had thought of individual eminence, she had thought of it on the basis of character and wit, of what one might like in a gentleman's mind and in his talk. She herself was a character, she couldn't help being aware of that, and hitherto her visions of a completed consciousness had connected themselves largely with moral images, things as to which the question would be whether they pleased her sublime soul. Lord Warburton loomed up before her, largely and brightly, as a collection of attributes and powers which were not to be measured by this simple rule, 
but which demanded a different sort of appreciation an appreciation that the girl with her habit of judging quickly and freely felt she lacked patience to bestow he appeared to demand of her something that no one else as it were had presumed to do what she felt was that a territorial a political a social magnet had conceived the design of drawing her into the system in which he rather invidiously lived and moved a certain instinct not imperious but persuasive told her to resist murmured to her that virtually she had a system and an orbit of her own it told her other things besides things which both contradicted and confirmed each other that a girl might do much worse than trust herself to such a man and that it would be very interesting to see something of his system from his own point of view that on the other hand however there was evidently a great deal of it which she should regard only as a complication of every hour and that even in the whole there was something stiff and stupid which would make it a burden furthermore there was a young man lately come from america who had no system at all but who had a character of which it was useless for her to try to persuade herself that the impression on her mind had been light the letter she carried in her pocket all sufficiently reminded her of the contrary smile not however i venture to repeat at this simple young woman from albany who debated whether she should accept an english peer before he had offered himself and who was disposed to believe that on the whole she could do better she was a person of great good faith and if there was a great deal of folly in her wisdom those who judge her severely may have the satisfaction of finding that later she became consistently wise only at the cost of an amount of folly which will constitute almost a direct appeal to charity lord warburton seemed quite ready to walk to sit or to do anything that isabel should propose and he gave her this assurance with his usual air of being particularly pleased to exercise a social virtue but he was nevertheless not in command of his emotions and as he strolled beside her for a moment in silence looking at her without letting her know it there was something embarrassed in his glance and his misdirected laughter yes assuredly as we have touched on the point we may return to it for a moment again the english are the most romantic people in the world and lord warburton was about to give an example of it he was about to take a step which would astonish all his friends and displease a great many of them and which had superficially nothing to recommend it the young lady who trod the turf beside him had come from a queer country across the sea which he knew a good deal about her antecedents her associations were very vague to his mind except in so far as they were generic and in this sense they showed as distinct and unimportant miss archer had neither a fortune nor the sort of beauty that justifies a man to the multitude and he calculated that he had spent about twenty-six hours in her company he had summed up all this the perversity of the impulse which had declined to avail itself of the most liberal opportunities to subside and the judgment of mankind as exemplified particularly in the more quickly judging half of it he had looked these things well in the face and then had dismissed them from his thoughts he cared no more for them than for the rosebud in his buttonhole it is the good fortune of a man who for the greater part of a lifetime has abstained without effort from making himself disagreeable to his friends that when the need comes for such a course it is not discredited by irritating associations i hope you had a pleasant ride said isabel who observed her companion's hesitancy it would have been pleasant if for nothing else than that it brought me here are you so fond of garden court the girl asked more and more sure that he meant to make some appeal to her wishing not to challenge him if he hesitated and yet to keep all the quietness of her reason if he proceeded it suddenly came upon her that her situation was one which a few weeks ago she would have deemed deeply romantic the park of an old english country house with the foreground embellished by a great as she supposed nobleman in the act of making love to a young lady who on careful inspection should be found to present remarkable analogies with herself 
but if she was now the heroine of the situation, she succeeded scarcely the less in looking at it from the outside. "'I care nothing for Garden Court,' said her companion. "'I care only for you.' "'You've known me too short a time to have a right to say that, and I can't believe you're serious.' These words of Isabel's were not perfectly sincere, for she had no doubt whatever that he himself was. They were simply a tribute to the fact, of which he was perfectly aware, that those he had just uttered would have excited surprise on the part of a vulgar world. And moreover, if anything beside the sense she had already acquired, that Lord Warburton was not a loose thinker, had been needed to convince her, the tone in which he replied would quite have served the purpose. One's right in such a matter is not measured by the time, Miss Archer. It's measured by the feeling itself. If I were to wait three months, it would make no difference. I shall not be more sure of what I mean than I am to-day. Of course I've seen you very little, but my impression dates from the very first hour we met. I lost no time. I fell in love with you then. It was at first sight, as the novels say. I know now that's not a fancy phrase, and I shall think better of novels for evermore. Those two days I spent here settled it. I don't know whether you suspected I was doing so, but I paid, mentally speaking, I mean, the greatest possible attention to you. Nothing you said, nothing you did, was lost upon me. When you came to Lockley the other day, or rather when you went away, I was perfectly sure. Nevertheless, I made up my mind to think it over, and to question myself narrowly. I've done so. All these days I've done nothing else. I don't make mistakes about such things. I'm a very judicious animal. I don't go off easily, but when I'm touched, it's for life. It's for life, Miss Archer, it's for life," Lord Warburton repeated in the kindest, tenderest, pleasantest voice Isabel had ever heard, and looking at her with eyes charged with the light of a passion that had sifted itself clear of the baser parts of emotion, the heat, the violence, the unreason, and that burned as steadily as a lamp in a windless place. By tacit consent as he talked, they had walked more and more slowly, and at last they stopped and he took her hand. "'Ah, Lord Warburton, how little you know me,' Isabel said very gently. Gently, too, she drew her hand away. "'Don't taunt me with that. That I don't know you better makes me unhappy already. It's all my loss. But that's what I want, and it seems to me I'm taking the best way. If you'll be my wife, then I shall know you, and when I tell you all the good I think of you, you'll not be able to say it's from ignorance. "'If you know me little, I know you even less,' said Isabel. "'You mean that, unlike yourself, I may not approve on acquaintance? Ah, of course that's very possible. But think, to speak to you as I do, how determined I must be to try and give satisfaction. You do like me rather, don't you?' "'I like you very much, Lord Warburton,' she answered, and at this moment she liked him immensely. "'I thank you for saying that. It shows you don't regard me as a stranger. I really believe I've filled all the other relations of life very creditably, and I don't see why I shouldn't fill this one, in which I offer myself to you, seeing that I care so much more about it. Ask the people who know me well. I've friends who'll speak for me.' "'I don't need the recommendation of your friends,' said Isabel. "'Ah, now that's delightful of you. You believe in me yourself.' "'Completely,' Isabel declared. She quite glowed there, inwardly, with the pleasure of feeling she did. The light in her companion's eyes turned into a smile, and he gave a long exhalation of joy. "'If you're mistaken, Miss Archer, let me lose all I possess.' She wondered whether he meant this for a reminder that he was rich, and on the instant felt sure that he didn't. He was thinking that, as he would have said himself, and indeed he might safely leave it to the memory of any interlocutor, especially of one to whom he was offering his hand. Isabel had prayed that she might not be agitated, and her mind was tranquil enough even while she listened and asked herself what it was best she should say to indulge in this incidental criticism. 
what she should say had she asked herself her foremost wish was to say something if possible not less kind than what he had said to her his words had carried perfect conviction with them she felt she did also mysteriously matter to him i thank you more than i can say for your offer she returned at last it does me great honour ah don't say that he broke out i was afraid you'd say something like that i don't see what you've to do with that sort of thing i don't see why you should thank me it's i who ought to thank you for listening to me a man you know so little coming down to you with such a thumper of course it's a great question i must tell you that i'd rather ask it than have to answer myself but the way you've listened or at least your having listened at all gives me some hope don't hope too much isabel said oh miss archer her companion murmured smiling again in his seriousness as if such a warning might perhaps be taken but as the play of high spirits the exuberance of elation should you be greatly surprised if i were to beg you not to hope at all isabel asked surprised i don't know what you mean by surprise it wouldn't be that it would be a feeling very much worse isabel walked on again she was silent for some minutes i'm very sure that highly as i already think of you my opinion of you if i should know you well would only rise but i'm by no means sure that you wouldn't be disappointed and i say that not in the least out of conventional modesty it's perfectly sincere i'm willing to risk it miss archer her companion replied it's a great question as you say it's a very difficult question i don't expect you of course to answer it outright think it over as long as it may be necessary if i can gain by waiting i'll gladly wait a long time only remember that in the end my dearest happiness depends on your answer i should be very sorry to keep you in suspense said isabel oh don't mind i'd much rather have got a good answer six months hence than a bad one to-day but it's very probable that even six months hence i shouldn't be able to give you one that you think good why not since you really like me ah oh, you must never doubt that said isabel well then i don't see what more you can ask it's not what i ask it's what i can give i don't think i should suit you i really don't think i should you needn't worry about that that's my affair you needn't be a better royalist than the king it's not only that said isabel but i'm not sure i wish to marry any one very likely you don't i've no doubt a great many women begin that way said his lordship who be it averred did not in the least believe in the axiom he thus beguiled his anxiety by uttering but they're frequently persuaded ah that's because they want to be and isabel lightly laughed her suitor's countenance fell and he looked at her for a while in silence i'm afraid it's my being an englishman that makes you hesitate he said presently i know your uncle thinks you ought to marry in your own country isabel listened to this assertion with some interest it had never occurred to her that mr touchett was likely to discuss her matrimonial prospects with lord warburton has he told you that i remember his making the remark he spoke perhaps of americans generally he appears himself to have found it very pleasant to live in england isabel spoke in a manner that might have seemed a little perverse but which expressed both her constant perception of her uncle's outward felicity and her general disposition to elude any obligation to take a restricted view it gave her companion hope and he immediately cried with warmth ah my dear miss archer old england's a very good sort of country you know and it will be still better when we furbished it up a little oh don't furbish it lord warburton leave it alone i like it this way well then if you like it i'm more and more unable to see your objection to what i propose i'm afraid i can't make you understand you ought at least to try i've a fair intelligence are you afraid afraid of the climate we can easily live elsewhere you know 
you can pick out your climate the whole world over these words were uttered with a breadth of candour that was like the embrace of strong arms that was like the fragrance straight in her face and by his clean breathing lips of she knew not what strange gardens what charged airs she would have given her little finger at that moment to feel strongly and simply the impulse to answer lord warburton it's impossible for me to do better in this wonderful world i think than commit myself very gratefully to your loyalty but though she was lost in admiration of her opportunity she managed to move back into the deepest shade of it even as some wild caught creature in a vast cage the splendid security so offered her was not the greatest she could conceive what she finally bethought herself of saying was something very different something that deferred the need of really facing her crisis don't think me unkind if i ask you to say no more about this to-day certainly certainly her companion cried i wouldn't bore you for the world you've given me a great deal to think about and i promise you to do it justice that's all i ask of you of course and that you'll remember how absolutely my happiness is in your hands isabel listened with extreme respect to this admonition but she said after a minute i must tell you that what i shall think about is some way of letting you know that what you ask is impossible letting you know it without making you miserable there's no way to do that miss archer i won't say that if you refuse me you'll kill me i shall not die of it but i shall do worse i shall live to no purpose you live to marry a better woman than i don't say that please said lord warburton very gravely that's fair to neither of us to marry a worse one then if there are better women than you i prefer the bad ones that's all i can say he went on with the same earnestness there's no accounting for tastes his gravity made her feel equally grave and she showed it by again requesting him to drop the subject for the present i'll speak to you myself very soon perhaps i shall write to you at your convenience yes he replied whatever time you take it must seem to me long and i suppose i must make the best of that i shall not keep you in suspense i only want to collect my mind a little he gave a melancholy sigh and stood looking at her a moment with his hands behind him giving short nervous shakes to his hunting crop do you know i am very much afraid of it of that remarkable mind of yours our heroine's biographer can scarcely tell why but the question made her start and brought a conscious blush to her cheek she returned his look a moment and then with a note in her voice that might almost have appealed to his compassion so am i my lord she oddly exclaimed his compassion was not stirred however all he possessed of the faculty of pity was needed at home ah be merciful be merciful he murmured i think you had better go said isabel i'll write to you very good but whatever you write i'll come and see you you know and then he stood reflecting his eyes fixed on the observant countenance of bunchy who had the air of having understood all that had been said and of pretending to carry off the indiscretion by a simulated fit of curiosity as to the roots of an ancient oak there's one thing more he went on you know if you don't like lockley if you think it's damp or anything of that sort you need never go within fifty miles of it it's not damp by the way i've had the house thoroughly examined it's perfectly safe and right but if you shouldn't fancy it you needn't dream of living in it there's no difficulty whatever about that there are plenty of houses i thought i'd just mention it some people don't like a moat you know good-bye i adore a moat said isabel good-bye he held out his hand and she gave him hers a moment a moment long enough for him to bend his handsome bared head and kiss it then still agitating in his mastered emotion his implement of the chase he walked rapidly away he was evidently much upset isabel herself was upset but she had not been affected as she would have imagined 
what she felt was not a great responsibility a great difficulty of choice it appeared to her that there had been no choice in the question she couldn't marry lord warburton the idea failed to support any enlightened prejudice in favour of the free exploration of life that she had hitherto entertained or was now capable of entertaining she must write this to him she must convince him and that duty was comparatively simple but what disturbed her in the sense that it struck her with wonderment was this very fact that it cost her so little to refuse a magnificent chance with whatever qualifications one would lord warburton had offered her a great opportunity the situation might have discomforts might contain oppressive might contain narrowing elements might prove really but a stupefying anodyne but she did her sex no injustice in believing that nineteen women out of twenty would have accommodated themselves to it without a pang why then upon her also should it not irresistibly impose itself who was she what was she that she should hold herself superior what view of life what design upon fate what conception of happiness had she that pretended to be larger than these large these fabulous occasions if she wouldn't do such a thing as that then she must do great things she must do something greater poor isabel found ground to remind herself from time to time that she must not be too proud and nothing could be more sincere than her prayer to be delivered from such a danger the isolation and loneliness of pride had for her mind the horror of a desert place if it had been pride that interfered with her accepting lord warburton such a betise was singularly misplaced and she was so conscious of liking him that she ventured to assure herself it was the very softness and the fine intelligence of sympathy she liked him too much to marry him that was the truth something assured her there was a fallacy somewhere in the glowing logic of the proposition as he saw it even though she mightn't put her very finest finger-point on it and to inflict upon a man who offered so much a wife with a tendency to criticise would be a peculiarly discreditable act she had promised him she would consider his question and when after he had left her she wandered back to the bench where he had found her and lost herself in meditation it might have seemed that she was keeping her vow but this was not the case she was wondering if she were not a cold hard priggish person and on her at last getting up and going rather quickly back to the house felt as she had said to her friend really frightened at herself End of chapter twelve